Hello, and welcome to what I like to call Hot Pepper Metaphysics. So the rules of the game of Hot Pepper Metaphysics is that I eat <laughs> this hot chili pepper, and then I attempt to explain and I try not to die in the meantime. So there you go. I'm gonna try and keep this brief for my own sake. The first theory we're gonna tackle is Quine's theory of being or non-being. First though, before I get into everything, I'm gonna eat this hot pepper. So Quine's main goal in this paper is to tackle the platonic riddle of non-being. <laughs> the riddle of non-being basically states that non-being must in some sense be. In other words, if I was to say there is no Santa, <laughs> that references Santa, a thing, an object, and it contains the clause, there is. So metaphysically, it suggests that what you're trying to describe as non-being actually must exist in the world. This proposition pretty much flies in the face of Occam's razor, which states that you shouldn't believe in things that aren't absolutely necessary. This is an ontological issue in the realm of metaphysics. It refers to what existence is, what it means to exist. Quine's method isn't exactly dialogue, but he does use three characters. McX is kind of the idiot character. McX claims that when objects we refer to don't exist, or we claim that objects don't exist, what we're really talking about is an idea. Quine is gonna say that doesn't work because what existence deniers are talking about are the actual non-existing things, things that do not exist metaphysically. They're not talking about the ideas of those objects, which are a separate matter. So that's not gonna solve the, the riddle. The Wyman character, really Minong, is gonna say, well, okay, non-existing objects are unactualized possibles. And that's what we're talking about when we say something like, there is no Mermaid. Mermaid is an unactualized possible. It has the property of non-existence, similar to a property of color like blueness or redness. Quine is going to say that this, this prospect of keeping all of these non-existing objects in the metaphysical world is going to result in a really overpopulated field of ontological existence. It's going to be overcrowded. It's just going to fill your plane of existence with useless crap, so to speak. Yet, he still wants to be able to talk about them sensibly. Quine says that he much prefers a kind of desert landscape, a kind of plane of existence that preserves Occam's razor. So this is his challenge. Descriptive non-existence without contradiction. Quine's specific method for tackling this riddle of non-being problem is to appeal to something that Bertrand Russell already talked about. I'm actually dying. Bertrand Russell talks about a theory of descriptions. Quine is going to use this theory of descriptions to try and solve the riddle of non-being. How he's going to do this is to point out and correct the contradiction that is inherent when we say, for example, there is no mermaid. There is seems to denote existence. Mermaid, 
as a name seems to point to an actual object, an actual being in the world. So when we say there is no mermaid or mermaids do not exist, the fact that we've stated a clause that denotes existence and then denied it creates a contradiction. Quine needs to resolve this contradiction if he's gonna have this desert landscape that he wants to postulate and metaphysically he prefers. How he does this is by appealing to Merchant Russell's description of how terms denote. It works with the use of three premises. Let's take, just for example, the statement, there is no mermaid. The first premise would therefore be, there is a mermaid. The second premise, there is only one of this thing, a mermaid. The third, this mermaid exists. It is. Because mermaid as a name seems to, seems to reference a specific object in the world, Quine is going to say we've got to replace this name that usually acts as a pointer with some sort of collection of descriptions. For example, for mermaid I might say half human, half fish beings that live in the sea. Now that doesn't seem to, that seems to look, no longer point to one specific object in the world. Getting one step closer to being able to logically deny existence completely with no contradictions. So let's plug that in now to our three premise system. One, there is a half human and half fish being that lives in the sea. Two, there is only one of this this half human, half fish being. Three, this half human, half being, half being, this half human, half fish being exists. This thing is. Okay, now we've got the existence claim as a three premise denotation. Now, in order to reject the existence of this description, instead of plugging the non-existence claim into the end of the sentence, such as, there is no mermaid, we plug the description where mermaid used to be, and we plug a negation to the front. That might look something like this. As you can see, there's no longer a contradiction of terms, and it no longer looks like you're necessarily referring to objects in the world while simultaneously denying their existence. Is that good enough? <laughs> well, it's gonna have to be, because I'm dying. <laughs> and there you have the hot chili description of Quine on what there is. Specifically, how Quine solves the riddle of non-being, otherwise known as Plato's beard, by reference to Russell's theory of description. Hello, folks, and welcome back. It's day four of Hot Pepper Metaphysics. Day two and three were spent recovering. I'm here to present to you the fictionalist account of a theory of mathematical objects. Get excited. I don't need these. So by now you know the drill. So mathematical fictionalism is basically in opposition to mathematical Platonism. To understand what the fictionalists are doing, we kind of have to grasp what the Platonists are doing. 
Platonists claim that mathematical objects exist. Their argument can be summed up in three basic premises. <sighs> okay. Holy crap. Focus. Just do it. Just do it. One, abstract mathematical objects exist. Two, the sentences we construct using those abstract mathematical objects are true. For example, four is even is a true statement for Platonists. And three, mathematical objects exist independently of minds thinking about them. They're mind independent. So it doesn't require humans to be around using mathematical objects to construct sentences for those objects to actually exist. So as I said, for Platonists, mathematical objects are abstract, they're mind independent, they're non-physical, non-mental, non-spatio-temporal, but they exist. And therefore, the sentences that we construct of them are true. Now let's move on to fictionalism. Fictionalism is going to concede in part to the first premise. It's going to say, yes, okay, our mathematical sentences do purport to refer to abstract mathematical objects. However, there are no such thing as abstract objects. Given that there are no such thing as abstract objects, there are no such thing as abstract mathematical objects. Now, if I was to say again, four is even, intuitively it seems that that sentence is true, but fictionalists are going to have to say, no, that sentence is false. Why? Well, if I was to say to you, Santa has a red beard, Santa has a red beard? What has Santa been doing? If I was to say to you, Harry Potter lives in England and goes to Hogwarts, or did, that sentence is false, simply for the fact that Harry Potter is a fictional character. He doesn't exist. So any statement that you make about him may be true in the context of the fiction, but in the actual world, it's false. Fictionalists are going to take much the same approach to abstract mathematical objects. Now the analogy with fiction could end there, and for many theorists, it does. But the comparison can go further, and it can actually be sort of useful. For instance, you might wonder, well, if all the sentences that we construct with mathematical objects are actually false, and abstract mathematical objects don't really exist... I'm getting better at this. Alright, focus. And if mathematical objects don't really exist, what are mathematicians doing? What are they doing with their days? What's the point? Um, well, an obvious response to this is, well, math seems to work. It's pretty applicable to life and to reality. But then the question might be, well, why is it so applicable? if the sentences are actually false and the objects don't exist. Here is where the analogy with fiction becomes even more useful. Just as fiction helps us understand... It's getting worse now. Um, just as fiction helps us understand life and can, in many cases, be applicable and worthwhile to practice, we could say the same thing if we draw the further analogy with mathematics. Whether you go that next step <coughs> and draw that analogy further with fiction, it should be pointed out that mathematical fictionalism is actually a, also a form of mathematical nominalism, basically the belief that mathematical objects don't exist. Thank you for joining me for Hot Pepper Metaphysics. Join me never for another episode of Hot Pepper Metaphysics.